There's a lot of momentum building in the renewable energy space that can change our world and also resource recovery. So I'm really optimistic about the conversations that are going on around the world in that space. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about things at a macro level, uh, particularly around climate and the environment, et cetera. But uh, thinking at a micro level, which obviously informs the macro level, the thing that's making me optimistic is our staff and our people at Greening Australia. You know, there's 40 of them that have been, you know, basically in place or in lockdown for, for six months now. And they're, you know, um, uh, the way that they're contributing to each other and supporting each other and still making a contribution to the community is, is blowing me away. It's a real privilege to, to actually serve them. So very optimistic about our people and what they're doing for the planet and our community. Well, Victor, I think it's fairly simple. Um, the initiatives of Greening Australia, I mean, to get communities together, to actually work together and, and make Australia a greener place, uh, you have to be optimistic about that future. And as Julie said, you know, the new initiatives and new power sources, hydrogen and that, those types of uh, directions and governments embracing them is, um, is a, a good recipe for optimism. Hi, it's Victor Purton here, and welcome um, to the Optimism Cafe. Um, today it is just utterly special. Um, Greening Australia, I have admired for all of its time in existence. It's done wonderful things for Australia. Um, that wide brown land, Greening Australia, um, the two concepts go together fantastically. And today we are joined by its leaders, um, Brendan. We worked out we've known each other for 20 years and, and probably longer and his ability to engage communities, his ability to inspire people is without question. So, Brendan, welcome. Thank you, Victor. Hello, everyone. And Julie Green, um, a member of the, the Centre for Optimism. Um, some of you who are members of the Centre for Optimism will have seen Julie with her microphone walking the streets of Melden, um, asking random friends what makes you optimistic. And to see them light up um, and explain that as Julie interviews them is, is brought joy to my life on several occasions in the last two weeks. Julie Green, welcome. Great to be here, Victor. And Robert Masters, the chairman of the Centre for Optimism. As everyone says, how do you report from Canberra um, through the terms of 10 Prime Ministers and still remain optimistic about leadership. Robert Masters, welcome. Morning, Victor. Morning, everyone. So, um, as um, those of you who joined us before know, the first question we always ask our panellists and we always ask you is what makes you optimistic? Jolly Green, what makes you optimistic? There's a lot of things, but at the moment, Victor, um, because I'm very passionate about sustainability, there's a lot of momentum building in the renewable energy space that can change our world and also resource recovery. So I'm really optimistic about the conversations that are going on around the world in that space. Spot on, just the, the opportunity that appears around the world is just fantastic. And Brendan, what makes you optimistic? Well, Victor, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about things at a macro level, uh, particularly around climate and the environment, et cetera. But uh, thinking at a micro level, which obviously informs the macro level, the thing that's making me optimistic is our staff and our people at Greening Australia. You know, there's 40 of them that have been, you know, basically in place or in lockdown for, for six months now. And they're, you know, um, uh, the way that they're contributing to each other and supporting each other and still making a contribution to the community is is blowing me away. It's a real privilege to to actually serve them. So very optimistic about our people and what they're doing for the planet and our community. I was playing your videos for the 30 minutes beforehand from your YouTube channel and just the inspiration from every worker was just, you could just see it manifesting itself. So you're doing a great job in human resources leadership and volunteer leadership. So Robert Masters, you've had a long time to think about these things. What makes you optimistic? Uh, 
Well, Victor, I think it's fairly simple. Um, the initiatives of Greening Australia, I mean, to get up communities together to actually work together and, and make Australia a greener place, uh, you have to be optimistic about that future. And as Julie said, you know, the new initiatives and new power sources, hydrogen and that, those types of uh, directions and governments embracing them is, um, is a, a good recipe for optimism. Wonderful. So look, uh, Brandon and Julie, um, you know, I've read your strategy through to 2030 and, you know, for me, it's just inspiring. But I love the way you're harnessing the resources of big business, which now realises it needs to, to, to make a real statement about the environment, through to people like me and, and volunteers who just want to make a difference. So look, I'd love you just to, to talk a, a bit to our audience about this 2030 strategy and the highlights of what you're doing to improve the environment by harnessing the community. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here. I'm a director of Greening Australia and I've been a director for about five years and I chair um, what we call the FRAC, which is the Finance Risk and Audit as well. And what I really love about Greening is that they actually get things done on the ground. So they don't just talk about the environment, they get things done. And you can see from this opening slide, the envir it's an environmental enterprise. So we're trying to redefine ourselves. We are a not-for-profit, of course, but we do think bigger than just being a not-for-profit. We wanna have impact on the environment. And you can see there that we have challenges, clearly in nature and with communities but we think that nature, communities and economics or profit can actually all work together for the benefit of us all. And we'll hope to explain that as we go through this presentation. Thank you, Brendan. So just a little bit about us, what makes us optimistic? And I think, Victor, you've done that really well. But just for those that don't know too much about us, if you look on the right there, we've got a turnover just about 32 mil. And what we're really focusing on there is that we don't rely too heavily on government. In the past, we've been very, very government dependent on income. And because our 2030 goals are so huge, we know that government, state and federal cannot fund what we do. So we have to think laterally and reach out to the business community and also philanthropists to help us do the things that we need to do into the future. So that sort of shifting is happening with our revenue streams. Now we have been around for a while, um, 38 years. We are expert in land restoration. We do have a lot of PhD people, so it is science led and data driven. And as I said, we really want to diversify our income streams. And we acknowledge that government have got their hands full at the moment. So what you'll see throughout the presentation is where we can make a difference um, more is really with partnering with big business. And we'll take you through what we're doing with Woodside in particular, where they have a need to offset some of their um, activities, their gas activities with carbon credits and how we can help them with that. And as well as that, um, our chair actually, um, James Atkins, put out a piece which was, which is on our website and it's to do with the fact that, okay, so we're a not-for-profit or we're an environmental enterprise, but we can't really keep thinking that way. How do we, as an entity, engage with the broader community to reinvent ourselves really and have a disruption to this sector because we know that reforestation has a fantastic impact on CO2 because trees just suck in CO2 um, into, uh, from our atmosphere and helps with climate change. But we need to do that on a really massive scale. So how are we gonna do that? So we're in the process at the moment of really challenging our business model as to how we do that. And just to finish, the, um, we are very optimistic because in this year, 2020, when we've had the COVID pandemic to deal with, 
most of our contracts are actually still going and we have actually had our biggest planting season um, and, and partly driven by the fact that we've been doing that partnering with business and, um, and, and Woodside and others around Australia. So that sets the scene. I'll now hand over to you, Brendan. Thank you. So um, just thank you, Julie. Um, so just as a nice segue there, one of the things um, consistent with this concept of an environmental enterprise is we see that we uh, solve bold and complex problems to produce stated financial and non-financial objectives. I think everyone on this uh, link would understand the financial objectives, uh, but the non-financial objectives are a range of people, community and environmental targets that we align to the financial performance of the business. So bold and complex problems, generating stated financial and non-financial returns, but because we are a not-for-profit, for reinvestment back into the vision and mission of the organisation. So essentially we see ourselves as a fund where we generate these returns and the financial returns just keep going back into the business. And in the last few years, we've spent a lot of time investing in ourselves so that we can position for growth, systems, structures, et cetera. But now we're doing really cool stuff like investing in technology and innovation to really scale uh, our implementation and execution, which we'll talk a little bit more about. In terms of targets, those non-financial objectives and targets, um, we, we don't come up with the science, although we are science led, I think about 10 to 15% of our workforce is PhD. We don't come up with the science, nor do we set the targets, which uh, we shoot uh, to make a contribution to uh, in terms of international targets like Paris 2050, Australia's biodiversity targets, uh, closing the gap targets, the Reef 2050 plan, et cetera. They are done by government. They are done by policy institutions. Um, and what we do is we, and in this instance, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we identify where we can make a contribution and we set a target for ourselves of what we will contribute to that. So if you invest in Greening Australia or you support Greening Australia, you will know that our targets and our objectives, which I'm just about to show you, are strongly linked to um, regional, national and international targets set by experts such as the UN and others. Um, the map of Australia that you see here shows where we're focusing our effort at the moment. And rather than go through each of the programs, what I'll tell you is that when we went through a visioning exercise in the middle of the last decade, middle of the last decade, uh, remember when we're all waiting for 2000 to come around, um, uh, we decided that our mission, our vision, our objective, our purpose was uh, solving great environmental challenges demonstrating proof of impact and producing inspirational stories. So, Victor, I guess in the concept of, of today, we're anchored in, anchored in optimism. And one of the, uh, two of the case studies that we're showing you and why Julie and I have selected these case studies is because on both of these issues, people have told us it's too hard and you can't do it. And the answer is after research or data, what's the, what's the next step? We need more research, we need more data. And ours is no, we need to get started. So. We are an organisation that's built out of uh, the world needing us to do something uh, and provide demonstration of how you take on great challenges. Okay, so 2030, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, uh, this, this window that we're all understanding around uh, how we need to respond to the most critical challenges around climate change. And the targets, as I said there before, that we've set for ourselves on the ground, as Julie said, not in the office, on the ground, actual tangible demonstration um, of, uh, of, of landscape, scale, landscape scale restoration is 330,000 hectares. Now it's a bit hard to think about, you know, how big 330,000 hectares is uh, when you're sitting in your office watching it down via a webinar. A webinar. Um, but a bit later, um, uh, well, we were going to show you a video. We'll release some videos and we'll show you one site that's 2,000 hectares and it's massive. And you look at it and you'll go, wow, so we're talking 2,000 hectares to 330,000 hectares. We'll sequester over a million tonnes of carbon per annum. And while we're doing that, we'll also support agricultural productivity, catchment health, uh, community engagement through that sequestration activity. So going very much back to Julie's comment there before about the environment, community and economy being connected in ways that benefit them all. 
half a billion plants going in the ground, half a billion. And to put that into context, over the last few years, we've averaged six to seven million a year. One of our sites this year with Woodside uh, is five million alone. So this scale piece is coming. Um, politicians always ask me, how do you get the landholders on board? We actually don't find that to be a huge issue. We find that landholders generally are very progressive. They're not thinking in social, socio-political timeframes. They're thinking intergenerational. They're thinking succession. They're thinking legacy, but they're also thinking about their balance sheet as well as a P&L. So uh, we believe that we'll engage uh, 6,600 landholders during that time. That's a lot of farmers. Uh, 10,000 hectares of wetlands and rivers being restored and 20 flagship threatened animals conserved. There's a whole stack of other targets as well, but we just picked a couple of the, the really high points here to talk to you about. So the first case study uh, that I'm going to talk about is Woodside. Um, and some of you on the call are, are not actually reading the questions in the chat function at the moment. Um, and some of you may have already asked this question, why would environmental organisation work uh, with a company like Woodside? Why? You know, that's the dark side versus the light side. That's the left versus the right. Well, to be fair, what Julian was talking about before, this concept of environment, communities and, in, and economies connected in ways that work for, for, that benefits everyone, that gets to the heart of it. Businesses in our experience, and particularly through COVID-19, are demonstrating to us that um, some people are playing not to lose, but a lot are playing to win. And the ones that are playing to win, that's that optimism lens, is they are taking a, a long-term view of their business and recognising with or without good government policy, and I'm, this is not a comment on government policy, but they're recognising that if you're going to be in this for a long game and you follow the science and you follow the data, your business is going to change. And while you might be in oil and gas at the moment, uh, you need to make that oil and gas more efficient, you need to make it greener, you need to make long-term commitments about the transition. And again, you follow the science and the data. Not the least, you listen to what your investment investors, your clients and your customers are telling you, which is, we want you to change. We're not asking you to change. We're telling you with how we influence your organisation that we need you to change. For us, uh, for Greening Australia, again, that question of why you would work with someone like Woodside is they have access to things that we need in our sector. So how are we going to go from 6 million trees a year to 500 million by uh, 2030? We need technology, we need innovation, we need scale, and we need long-term investment, which comes in the form of environmental credit programs. So with, with Woodside, the overview here, a long-term scalable strategic carbon partnership that generates credits. In phase one, we're revegetating 5,000 hectares. And as I said, there's a video which we'll release later, which shows 2,000 hectares in 2020. So that's phase one. That's the first project we're doing of the large scale ambition is just 5,000 hectares. So, uh, and again, to put that in the context, we did about 6,000 hectares last year. So the first project they're doing is nearly our full footprint from the previous few years. Big focus on people, communities, and particularly indigenous communities. Um, indigenous communities, we've been working with them for a long time and they tell us that they want to work with us, they want us on the bus, they want to drive the bus and they want to tell us when to get off. And there's a great uh, video, which again Victor will release later, which shows you how Indigenous enterprises, not Indigenous employees, Indigenous enterprises have been incorporated into our direct supply chain and we are contracting them for services that they provide to us and we use them for seed collection at one part of the year tree planting in the other part of the year, and they're telling us that's the way they want to work with us. They don't just want to be tree planters. They actually want to be involved in running their own businesses in a self-determining way. And from a um, model point of view, we're working with uh, Woodside to remove some of the barriers that we have to landscape restoration at scale, uh, which is buying land and having access to land because trees need ground, obviously. And, uh, um, you know, one of the hardest challenges we've got is both these two previous points is around seed, and land and how you scale up both of those. So this is the video uh, that I was going to show, but I'm not going to show because we've had a few technology issues. However, we will release it later and it's also available on our YouTube channel and other social media. And this is a great example of how when uh, an organisation like Woodside and Granting Australia partner for the long term through an environmental credit program, so not a three year grant, we're talking about a 25 year production cycle um, and that 
25 year production cycle is very, very important because in our business, we talk about impact and we talk about scale. And in impact, you can only truly measure impact when you have a change in status. And I'm talking to the scientists and the engineers and the, and the economists on the, on the call here. You only have impact when you have change in status or change in life condition. And in the biological world, you really can't do that in a year. You need three plus years at a minimum to actually truly measure and, and monitor and evaluate whether your theory of change is, approved, is proven correct. So for indigenous communities, for the environment, for local agricultural communities, and for Woodside here is the two to three year funding cycle, which has so often been used to address the great environmental challenges and social challenges of our generation just doesn't work. You're only just getting started after two years. So in this video, when you take a look at it, what you will see is how we're directly engaging Indigenous employees, working on agricultural land, using the resources of a company like Woodside for us to implement an environmental credit program over 25 years. So that's what you'll see. Phase one, 5,000 hectares. The scale that we're contemplating is nearly the entire 330,000 hectares off one client. So as you can see, this is a pathway to scale. Now, an important point here around technology and innovation, before I go on to the Great Barrier Reef, is we won't be able to organically grow and service our business out to meet those targets that you saw on one of the earlier slides. You simply can't grow the workforce exponentially until you have 1,000, 1,500 people working for you. Now, despite my comments earlier about feeling so optimistic about our staff, I'd love to have a thousand people working for Greening Australia because that's a thousand great citizens in the community and on the planet. But in truth, it's a risky enterprise for, for our organisation to be that big and to manage a geographically dispersed workforce um, or over all, or many different regions across Australia. Different, it's, it's too risky. But equally, it's a slow way of us to get there. What Woodside are expertise at is developing resource production at scale. So that's their expertise and they're helping us develop our supply chain, our distribution model, but, you, but importantly, how you incorporate things like tech, innovation, data management, artificial intelligence into your business model. So you replicate your business and you scale in the same way that successful businesses do in the commercial world. So, Greening Australia being an enterprise and being positive about our future is not about us becoming commercial. That's what people think sometimes. Oh, you're becoming commercial or you're moving away from your not-for-profit roots. No, as people know from John Collins' is Good to Great, you, you, it's not a, you don't become a great business because you adopt the principles of commercial businesses. You adopt the principles of great businesses. You adopt the principles of what makes businesses great. And in this current generation, scale and impact backed by market-based schemes are supported by tech, innovation and data. And that really, in summary, is why we're working with Woodside. The next case study. So, so there's been studies on the Great Barrier Reef. Let me go back a bit, Victor. So there's two significant challenges facing the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the, the biggest one is climate change. And that's a global solution. That requires a global approach. And those 330,000 hectares, which I told you about before, and linked to those international targets, sequestering 1.3 million tonnes of carbon per annum, accumulating over 25 years, et cetera, you can see we're doing our bit for climate change as an organisation. You don't need to plant trees on the reef, in the reef, in the wetlands uh, to sequester carbon because the point source is actually the global atmosphere. It's not actually the, the lack of uh, carbon sequestration around the Great Barrier Reef, it's a global issue. And everyone on the planet needs to do something to protect the world's largest living organism. I would be horrified, I would be less than optimistic, Victor, if we saw the Great Barrier Reef die on our watch. Now, how embarrassing would that be for us as a generation? Now, that should motivate us that the world's largest living organism dies on our watch. We don't bat an eye when a species that's under 200 in a global level dies because we say, didn't stand a chance. But the world's largest living organism on the coastline of Australia could die on our watch without action. So climate change requires a global response. The second biggest issue is water quality. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about this, but each year there's 10 million tonnes of sediment which flow off the catchments, so a very local issue, which flow off the catchments and go into uh, the Great Barrier Reef and push north. 
So without turning this into a scientific lesson, what I would say to you is that the Great Barrier Reef is fighting the greatest health challenge of its life in terms of climate change. And it's got a permanent dose of the flu. It's lacking resilience in its ability to withstand the greatest health challenge of its life. Now, what do we know about COVID-19? And I'm not an epidemiologist or an expert, but we hear regularly that where there is underlying health conditions, it actually greatly affects people's ability to fight uh, COVID-19. So it's a bit of a like situation there. That's what this resilience theme is all about. So we're focusing on water quality as a local solution and so are many other organisations, I must say, it's not just Greening Australia. Um, but our objective is to restore 10,000 hectares of wetlands to stop that sediment. 400,000 tonnes, our target, 400,000 tonnes of that 10 million, to stop 400,000 tonnes of sediment flowing into the reef each year, getting into the estuarine area, pushing north, um, and really reducing the, the ability of the reef to fight climate change. We partner with around 25 Indigenous groups to restore country and create jobs and enterprise. So this economy, communities and environment piece is coming through time and time and time again. So this is the things we do. Uh, we make wetlands that previously look like this, look like this. So the before and the after, remembering what I said before, our message of optimism, great environmental challenges, demonstrating proof of impact and producing inspirational stories. But I'll ask you to see on these, a couple of observations on these two slides. First one here is if you look uh, a little bit to the back of the before shot, yes, that is a excavator that you see uh, in that wetland. It's an amphibious excavator. Uh, now, the way that we, I talked this about this earlier, the way that we've talked about uh, addressing great environmental challenges in the past is using grants and using volunteers. And as we look forward, grants and volunteers are still a super important part of what we do, but it's not gonna get us the whole way. So while that's a pretty crude example of the type of technology and innovation uh, that we're using, you know, we wouldn't have used an amphibious excavator to get in there and create that effect in, afternoon, in an afternoon previously. We would have been using volunteers. We probably would have been using Roundup, um, which is terrible for catchments as we know now. But you can see that we are adopting the principles of uh, you know, scaling and impact in the commercial world to actually drive environmental performance. What I'll also tell you about this wetland here, this is called Crooked Waterhole, uh, is the landholder there won an award from us for being landholder of the year. Uh, but secondly, uh, it was just coincidentally that I was there, but the day after this got done, um, James Cook University and their Trop Water Institute were out monitoring and Barramundi were in that water hole the next day. Amazing. You know, so sometimes Mother Nature uh, can't get started by herself, but when you get her started, she's pretty good. Um, here's the second one. So we'd all be familiar for those that are in Australia and, and wherever you are in the world, is that erosion is an issue. So when you remove trees out of the landscape, you have high rainfall events, you see these, these gullies that form. Now, again, looking at the detail here is let, let's look at the before. And yes, that is people that you see standing in those gullies. Um, and Julie and I have both stood in those gullies. We actually might be in these photos, I'm not sure. Um, but those gullies are about 25 metres high. So when you stand in there, those that have been diving before, one of the most amazing things about diving is lying on your back and looking up at the surface and realising how low you are. When you're in these, um, how deep you are, when you're in these gullies, you, you look to the top of these gullies. Um, and every year uh, in the wet tropics and the, and, the, and, in, and, the, and the dry tropics as well, where they have these huge rainfall events, over clearing with highly erodible soils are creating a slurry, which are just washing into um, washing into the Great Barrier Reef. So that's the before and this is the after here. This is what we do inside six months. We've got a very tight window. That we, so this is like a civil excavation program or a civil construction program in many ways. Again, no volunteers, no grants. Uh, this is all done using large scale approaches, using uh, market-based instruments supplemented by in-kind and voluntary contributions, not driven by um, uh, in-kind contributions and volunteer contributions. And what we're trying to do here, clearly, is make very, very dirty water look or be very clean. And these are the results. So this is the first gully that we ever repaired. So that was on, as I said there before, this was after 20 years of telling people, us telling people, well, people telling us and people telling themselves, you can't fix this problem, it's too big. 
That's the first gully that we fixed. We had a 97% reduction in total suspended solids. So sediment, 97% reduction in sediment coming out of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Great Barrier Reef catchments going 100, 100 kilometres downstream uh, onto the Great Barrier Reef. So um, we set ourselves a target, <laughs> Julie would remember this, uh, 50 to 80%. Uh, reduction in sediment. And the question from the board to me was, how are you going to do that? And it's like, I don't know. Um, but we're going to have a go because that's what the world needs us to do because this thing's just going to get worse and the Great Barrier Reef is going to decline under our watch. So I think Greening Australia must do something here. Um, talking about being science led and getting landholders on board, the other thing you see there, the lady in the foreground, Dr. Lenise Wern, she's the head of our Great Barrier Reef program. So that's that science and impact led. She runs it in a commercial way. She, she, she effectively runs her own business uh, for Greening Australia using the investment that we get to her. She does all the science and the planning. The chap in the background is Bristow Hughes. He's 26 now, I think. He owns 80,000 hectares of land uh, in the Great Barrier Reef catchments. And he is a, one of our biggest supporters. Um, so he's the landholder that's out there saying, this is good for my business. He doesn't say this is good for the environment. He says, this is good for my business. So there you see there, impact, landholder engagement, science led. So getting towards the end of the formal presentation now, um, one of the things that our sector, and Julie talked about this concept of disruption um, and, and enterprise thinking, one of the things our sector doesn't do very well, and in fact, maybe I haven't done it particularly well in this presentation either, is we tell you what the problem is and then we tell you how to fix it. Now, not everyone on this call, and nor indeed myself, is a scientist that can get their head around um, uh, you know, deeply complex environmental issues. Um, equally, um, not everyone is trained to understand scientific or engineering style issues, but most of us understand commercial business cases. We understand economic decision-making. We, we are institutionally trained and culturally trained to understand uh, money and uh, how it all works, et cetera, et cetera. And so often, and even during this COVID-19 situation, uh, often what we're doing is, um, you know, when the government's looking for economic stimulus, we're giving them an environment story. That doesn't help them with their decision. So what I'd like to do here is talk to you about how we approach this from a socioeconomic point of view. And hopefully by the end, what you'll see is um, even if you don't care about the Great Barrier Reef, or even if you don't care about the fish, you actually go, hmm, well, that makes a bit of a sense from an economic point of view. But that's okay. Not everyone has to be an environmentalist. There was a study done by, I think, uh, Deloitte Access Economics and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation funded by National Australia Bank a couple of years ago that said the total asset value of the Great Barrier Reef is $56 billion. And maintenance should be $8 billion or something like that. Now, for those of you that run companies here, you know if you don't invest in your business, you reduce its asset base. So even if you don't care about the fish, even if you don't care about the world's largest living organism, I'm thinking to myself, $56 billion is worth protecting. So let's have a look here. Now the problem from an environmental point of view is we have eroding alluvial gullies, we have degraded wetlands, which mean basically when some water hits the ground, the dirt is washing into the river and it's going onto the reef. When you restore it and you restore the wetlands, you have the healthier reef. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm not an environmentalist. I go, that's great. That's really good. Fantastic. But I can't invest in it. I can't do anything with it. So let's look at it another way. Okay, so we do gully restoration. We create wetland restoration. We create blue carbon. Blue carbon is basically carbon credits out of result of um, uh, restoring gullies and restoring wetlands. We also produce biodiverse carbon which is Greening Australia's specialisation, native tree planting projects, which are converted into a financial product, which you can buy for compliance reasons, or you can sell for profit. So by fixing gullies, we create green tree planting credits. By fixing wetlands, we create blue carbon. We also create marine and land-based environmental offsets, with a lot of, which a lot of economic development depends on. We also create native seed sources, which is critical supply chain for large scale tree planting programs and biodiversity. We also produce returns back to landholders who receive productivity benefits and annual annuity streams via carbon offsets. So think about a lot of farmers and you hear about this in the central west of New South Wales that actually haven't run stock. 
I've put crops in in the last couple of years and are getting a payment stream or a revenue stream which smooths out volatility in their production cycle by carbon credits. Mines uh, produce offsets and get rehabilitation. Banks de-risk their loan valuation rate book. Government value of leasehold, so Australia's assets increase, which means it's more productivity. Water utilities reduce maintenance, capex by produce and produce carbon offsets. And insurance, insurance companies reduce underwriting. Agriculture and fishing and tourism uh, benefit from uh, greater levels of productivity. So I don't know whether that's made the point that I'm trying to make about economies, communities, environments being connected in ways that benefit them all. But we can tell, I'm, I'm, I can't do this on, uh, on screen, but if you covered the top part of it, you could see that investing in the environment is good for the economy. And government get water quality and tax revenue uplift, which means they don't have to spend as much money uh, fixing the reef. This is the other video that I was talking about, Victor, which we'll, we'll ask you to send around to everyone or make available. Um, and this is a drone shot of a 2000 hectare site that we're doing in Woodside. And what I'm asking you to do here when you take a look at it is, um, you know, just appreciate the scale of what 330,000 hectares is versus this, um, uh, versus this 1,000, versus this 2,000 hectare site. The other thing I'd ask you to look at too is great environmental challenges, demonstrating proof of impact. Just by looking at the screen grab here, you can see highly salty uh, uh, land. This was previously under agricultural production. It lost its agricultural productivity. There's no nutrient in the soil. The rainfall's low, etc. The biodiversity values are huge, but by targeting this property here and revegetating this property here, and there'll be trees growing on it now. And in fact, interestingly, um, Peter Coleman, the, Woods, the Woodside CEO, is actually visiting this site today. Uh, Victor asked if we could get him along to this presentation and he can't because he's actually visiting this site this afternoon. Um, you'll see that um, the huge scale, biodiverse restoration in place, addressing uh, saline issues, sequestering carbon, supporting biodiversity, providing carbon credits where there's a payment back to landholders using Indigenous enterprises. These are in the videos. And that's us anyway, Victor. I have to unmute myself. My, my <laughs> breath was taken away. Just, the, you know, because it, it's the mission and the economics as well. And, you know, the commentary on the side, people are just, blown away and I, as I said um, earlier I don't want to flatter you too much but you Brendan and you Julie have just always inspired me with your ability to communicate positive messages and can do can do that's brilliant look can I throw to Robert Masters who's uh, my brilliant uh, go-to person on leadership and strategy I think that, um uh, Brendan and Julie, just in, in relation to the slide, the most impressive and one of the things that I took out of it was in the past, the governments and in the political scene have always operated on a climate of fear, creating fear around, and as you were highlighting, um, you know, the Great Barrier Reef dying type situation. But where you seem to be going is not the climate of fear model. I was looking at what you're saying. It's a responsibility model or a, with an outcome of greening the planet or greening Australia. Is, is How much uh, credence do you put into the climate of fear factor in what you're actually trying to do to get people on side? Hmm. So, Mato, do you answer that you or do you do? Oh, look, just, just I'll have a go first, if you like, um, Brendan. I actually think fear is really, really counterproductive because humans, um, you know, like we actually retreat into ourselves when we actually have that fear um, so that we actually go to inaction. I mean, it's from our beginnings when we, you know, been hunting by lions and, and we just freeze. So I don't think that humans are very good responding to the fear factor. I think that if as leaders, we can show a vision, a positive optimistic vision about how you can do positive things like take action, as I said, first off, we've all got a responsibility to take action, I think, because we're, 
it's on our watch, as Brendan said, and if we don't do something, you know, we are really shirking our responsibility and leaving a bigger problem for our children and grandchildren. So I think it's, up, it's upon us as leaders to show a vision and take people with you. That, that's my view and fear doesn't work. Mm. Brendan? Yeah, thanks, uh, Julie. Um, I won't repeat what Julie said, Robert and everyone, except to say, I think um, we uh, it, it, we took on an attitude a few years ago that the world needed us to show that you can do something about great environmental challenges. And, and the thing about climate change and the environment is we actually do know what the answers are. It's not like coronavirus, you know, where we actually don't know whether it's a vaccine or something like that. The beautiful thing about the climate and the environment is you actually can do something about these issues. What we add to it is you can do something about these issues without exploiting them. Look, you have to talk about the, the, the gravity of the situation. The reef will die if we keep going as we are. However, in terms of looking forward, you don't need to destroy the economy, communities who have aspirations on the way. You can create that intersection of um, vision, objective and purpose. Because we go onto farmers' properties. We want them to be productive. We want them to run a good business. We want Aboriginal communities to be self-determining and get back onto country, et cetera. So, so we're not going in there with the attitude of there's a problem and we want to take something from you. Our attitude is more the other way. It, there's a problem here when we want to give something to you and also respect what you're trying to achieve. So let's do this together. Um, look, that's a bit of a journey. Um, but it's very much ingrained in the DNA of the organisation. I think that comes from our people from a long time ago, by the way. Um, I don't think it came from Julie and I. I think we inherited that from our people that have been with the organisation for a long time. Yeah, I, I think what you're doing is absolutely marvellous because from a, from a strategic um, point of view, it, I think the, the model that you're actually pursuing, the partnership model and outcomes model, is the, is the right path to just and it also leads into the leadership model. And you just mentioned it there, Brendan, it's a collaborative model, which leadership inspires. And I know even from family, you know, uh, young children are actually doing greening act activities at kindergarten, everything like getting mm -hmm. their hands dirty, planting and watching these plants grow. Now that has to be generational change in the making as well. So I commend you on that. And I think the collaborative model, as far as leadership is concerned, is just ideal for, the, you know, and that's reflective in the Woodside uh, principle, I, I assume. So they're pursuing it. Yes, they've got bigger business goals, but collaboration with the likes of your organisation has outcomes as well. So well done. Thank you. Uh, Rod Wade has joined us from San Diego. Um, as you know, California has almost identical environmental issues. And Rod is my go-to expert on the complexities of supply chain collaboration. So Rod, you had a comment and a question? I did, and thank you, Julie and Brendan. And yeah, we're, we're undergoing some, some pretty big uh, fire activity out here in California on the West Coast and a little bit inland Utah, Colorado, and Montana right now. Um, and that was my question, Brendan, you shared that was a huge number, the half a million plantings, uh, which was a significant increase. And I was just wondering, was that driven by the brush fire um, tragedy that you all suffered down in Australia through the end of last year and into the beginning of the year? Or was that already planned? Had you planned to take that dramatic a step up in the plantings uh, as part of, of the, the project? Yeah, good question. Um, so no, it wasn't driven by the fires. Um, uh, and in fact, one thing that Julie and I didn't do is tell you the journey that we've been on from a governance and strategy point of view. So prior to setting this strategy, uh, Julie was one of the first uh, in 40, nearly 40 years, one of the first directors who came in with uh, to be an independent non-executive director to drive strategy and governance in an organization that was previously a federation. Uh, so nine organisations trying to, you know, nine angels dancing on the head of the same pin. A bit mm. like your union at the moment and a bit like our federation here in Australia. So, so we got ourselves into a position to set a strategy. So we'd already set those targets beforehand. However, the bushfires basically, and, and not that we would say this publicly, basically was a bit of a told you so, 
That's why we're talking about these 500 million trees. That's why we're talking about this 330,000 hectares. However, one fantastic thing that came out of bushfires, and I know you've had 2 million acres burn in California, um, and you do some amazing stuff around restoration bonds as well with Blue Forest Conservation, who we have a partnership with out of Sacramento, um, is we already had a native seed deficit. So you can't plant a tree without seed. It's a bit like you can't do a steel project in China without iron ore from WA. You can't plant a tree without seed. We already had a native seed deficit in this country. Um, and so we are building a seed production area like a agricultural or horticultural seed production area for native seed in Western Sydney. We're doing that as part of the offset for the second Sydney airport. So we were already thinking about growing seed in the native seed production area. And in the middle of the bushfires, believe it or not, standing on the street outside a pub, I ne negotiated a $5 million contract with the Australian government to, um, to address the deficit of the 18 million hectares that was going to be, um, that was going to arise as a result of the bushfires. So, so we've done two things directly as a result of the bushfires. One, creating native seed banks um, for future fire events. But secondly, with World Wildlife Fund, WWF, who do some really good stuff, by the way, is looking at how you do restoration programs which don't assume you need to put the same stuff back. Now, inherent in communities, economies and environment thinking is we can't have people thinking trees are the problem, yeah? Because every time I look out my window, they're on fire in summer. So what we think about is how you design your restoration in a way that regenerates naturally, protects habitat, but as fires reach communities, they slow down. They don't get faster. They actually slow down because communities come first. So we're thinking about restoration from the 2030 point of view, as in what are we going to put book back, which is going to go through the various iterations of climate change, multiple fire events, how are communities going to grow and what does that mean from restoration? It's no longer a case of putting back what was there. It's now a case of predicting accurately how you can balance economies, communities, environment um, as part of a restoration regime. So while we haven't got this strategy as a result right of what you talked about, there has been some very good things come out of it, which are very much linked to 2030 goals. Great question, that inspiring answer. Sam Jewell. Look, I'm just thrilled watching this because I've been in this greening area for a long time and talking to farmers, obviously my main thing is around grazing, but um, I've been actually looking a lot around the ocean and runoff in the ocean and uh, there's, I've come across some pretty interesting stuff around the irrigation area to reduce chemical and water usage uh, using frequencies. And I'm just interested, I don't actually know any irrigators down here because my whole space has been around you know, spreading the poo, let's say, <laughs> with animals. <laughs> and um, I've, I've even been working on a big 250,000 hectare project in the desert with camels and, and a satellite yeah. team to look at carbon sequestration. So I've, I've been really looking at these big projects much more than just little ones. So I'm, lo I'm loving seeing how much you've managed to get going on the big scale. But is there anything that you're doing in the irrigation space? Like, I don't know any uh, irrigators, any irrigation? Uh, sorry, I, you broke up a little bit there, Sam. Could you say that again? The last are, you, are you any, using any irrigation or any areas that are doing irrigation? Uh, yes. So in, in the Great Barrier Reef catchments, um, a lot of the wetland work is with ponded pastures. Uh, and then equally, a lot of the agricultural zone in the southern part uses agricultural water. So um, uh, while we're not necessarily leading the way on chemical runoff and uh, different water application practices, et cetera, we work in an integrated way into that. Other, other institutions are probably more of an expert in that area. However, I think that um, in the future, we will design products, not necessarily landscape scale programs. I think we'll design products, which are a series of point source interventions, which go in to different agricultural regions which focus on some of the downstream effects of irrigation while also supporting transitional practices which is part of broader change management. So that's a more bespoke I think rather than a blunt uh, approach but it is the future. Water, irrigation and all the related effects is the next, I reckon it's the next frontier in my mind.
Oh, wonderful. Um, Angus Robinson uh, is going to be my co-host on our um, climate change um, innovation and opportunity event in a couple of weeks. Angus has got a, a lot of questions, but we might restrict it to one or two today. <laughs> well, I wanted to just ask a question relating to uh, CO2 reduction from the atmosphere um, as being a worthwhile strategic goal in accompaniment with Australia's efforts to reduce emissions. Brendan, looking at the our long-term targets to 2050 and thinking about that as a strategic goal, how do we measure that over that period so that we can get some realizable understanding of what can actually be achieved by concentrating extensive government and industry resources at CO2 reduction. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm going to give you an answer where I'll try and focus on a couple of, mm. or, or a couple of really specific points. Um, so one is that um, I, I am on record and I'll continue to say it and my board backs me is the government needs to reimagine their role in the environment. Mm. Yeah. So number one, yeah. they need to stop applying band-aids on top of band-aids on top of band-aids and see themselves like they do. And I've spent many years selling no victor in the aluminium industry. Mm. I was previously in manufacturing as well is um, in those sectors, they see themselves as a cornerstone investor. And they also see themselves as getting the, you know, getting the triggers right for investment. So let's see Australia as an investment ready landscape. So the government is a cornerstone investor that's removing barriers and getting the triggers right. There's the first part of your answer, not grants. Every time we start talking about grants, we need to say there's a role for that, but we're talking about something bigger here. We're talking about the 2050 targets. Yeah. In the context of the 2050 targets, to me, it's not about using the environment again as the blunt tool. It is about you know, we already know the government's a cornerstone investor. They're getting the regulatory and other triggers right. They're creating an investment ready landscape. And we've got sensibly designed environmental credit programs um, where you, it's not just about compliance, it's also about generating an economic return, which boosts agricultural productivity. So these things are working in unison. And then uh, when we look at an organization like ours, I'm so glad you asked me a question about 2050. Um, that 500 million trees, that's actually not about 500 million trees by 2030. That's actually about 10 billion by 2050, mm -hmm. which is 10% of Australia's agricultural emissions as part of the Paris 2050 targets. Mm -hmm. The three assumptions that we're making there is one, government will become the cornerstone investor. So they're not paying $100 million on grants, they're paying $100 million on setting up the, the right market for biodiversity credits, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, number two, we will get technology working. So instead of um, Julie and myself and a few other tree planters going out and planting 6,000 trees a day through the old fashioned method, mm -hmm. Julie and I will run six drones each, which are capable of doing 600,000 seedlings a day. Mm -hmm. So we will get that working. Yeah. And, the third one, and the third one is that we will also be able to model the socioeconomic return through natural capital accounting of green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you look at things like the Great Barrier Reef as an economy. You look at the narrow region of southeast New South Wales as an economy. You look at the Air Peninsula as an economy. We don't look at them as a, uh, as a, as a member of the House of Parliament or an electorate um, or a sub-socioeconomic region. So my answer, I didn't specifically answer your question, is it's about the principles of how, yeah. what, mm -hmm. and affecting that economic return, which benefits multiple sectors, not just the environment. Good, thank you. Again, brilliant question, um, inspiring answer. Um, Matt Lanigan is um, the leader of the Chapel Street traders. So in Melbourne, Chapel Street is our most famous retail street and it's closed. Um, and so Matt's having to start his business, helping to lead 2,500 other traders through this state of disaster. And Matt's got a, a brilliant question about community. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Um, and thanks, Julie and Brendan, for the information today. It's awesome. Um, I've learned so much. Um, I guess you, it's a two-part question. Um, you say that um, climate change is a global 
uh, a, a global solution. How big a part does local government play in that solution, in your opinion? And secondly, do you are you working on any projects that um, involve community electricity solutions um, for to you know to reduce uh, I guess to clean to clean up the energy being used, but also um, reduce the cost that it is to the community and also to um, the business owners. Mm. I can go first, if you like, Brendan. Just on local government, Matt, um, I do do quite a bit of work in some of my other boards with local government. So I'm on the board of a waste and resource recovery group. And we actually have areas where we actually do work with councils because, of course, they are responsible for taking away the municipal solid waste, right? So the local councils are actually really active at the moment in my in my view and they're declaring climate emergencies for their local um, government areas and with that they are then doing much more connection with the community about what can what individuals can do and what businesses can do to actually help with that bigger issue of climate change because things like waste and resource recovery, um, whilst it's probably small in terms of CO2 emissions, if we keep putting organic waste, for example, into our landfill, that produces methane. Methane is 28 times um, mm. the, the density of a CO2. So it's actually really bad to do. And why would you do it anyway? Because we need the organics to go back into the soil. Mm. So... You know, so local communities and governments have a really big role, I think, to play, and um, they can really connect with business and individuals. And then the the other part of your question, Matt, was about electricity. Well, greening don't really get involved in that per se. Um, I've got knowledge of that sector because I know that the electricity, the transformation of the electricity sector from coal fired to renewables is one of the biggest things that we can do globally to actually combat climate change. And there's a big move, if you talk about communities, to actually have more ownership of electricity supply within communities. So for example, solar on roofs, but there's also a, another movement which is about community solar as well. So, because not everyone can afford to put solar on roofs. So, for example, where I live, Newstead is um, a little town and they've put out an expression of interest to actually have a solar farm that will, that will actually give them the electricity they need for, for that community and also sell it into the grid. So I, I hope that sort of goes somewhere to answering your question. Brendan, do you have anything to add? I'll add something very briefly, which is... Um, on the very first slide that Julie and I showed, we, we showed one of our project officers and an Aboriginal elder standing in the field. And normally uh, what we say there is, this is the most important relationship in our organisation. Um, LinkedIn and management consultants want to tell you it's the chair and the CEO, but it doesn't matter how good the chair and the CEO and the CEO and the CEO is. If, um, and I think this is going to be a mega trend which is going to come out of COVID-19 is if the people on the ground, the people in the communities don't like the solution, they're not going to buy it. Um, so when you say the role of local government, let's just say local. The role of local is going to become even more important in these issues um, because strategy will only will level at a certain area, but you can't, well, I think we're all learning, you can't tell communities what they can have. Uh, they want to be involved in decision making. And I believe, whether it's local government or more broadly, that's going to be a mega trend coming out of this. this so we have a social license to operate, you know, including um, the, the Greening Australia CEO wheels into the Monero region of southeast New South Wales. They don't care about me. They don't care about me. They care about my local project officer because they know the project officer is going to, not going to leave on a plane. Not that we do that much at the moment, but know that the project officer is in that community embedded and cares what they care about. So your question is a good one, and I think it's going to be more important than it. It always was important, but I think it's important is going to be amplified in the future. Thank so you. Matt, maybe we should think global, act local. 
Okay, good. <laughs> On behalf of, of the Centre for Optimism, um, Brendan and Julie, um, I find you inspiring individuals on your own. Um, but clearly in Greening Australia, you have found a platform for inspiring the country uh, and indeed the world. And today, every question has been answered in a way that inspires. Um, you've brought together sensible environment uh, with sensible economics. And on behalf of everyone on the call, and everyone from the Centre for Optimism, may I thank you for your participation today. Well, we hope you enjoyed that wonderful Optimism Cafe with Greening Australia. The conversation actually continued and we'll share some of the continuing conversation, but we'd love you to get involved with the Centre for Optimism and the websites on the screen. And so too, Greening Australia. Um, which um, uses uh, the efforts of volunteers and collaborators to create a better Australia and a better world. Hope you've enjoyed it and enjoy the day. From Greening Australia's experience, do the companies come to this from a compliance, well, as part of their licence to operate, they're legal, and then discover the economic benefit? Or do they already have a feeling for the economic benefit before they get involved? in these massive projects? Yeah, look, that's, it's changed over time, I think, Scott. Um, and it's a really good question. Um, and a lot has changed in the last little while. I think um, uh, when I, so I've been with Green Australia for, um, uh, since the end of 2011, and we were 91% funded by government grants then. And we realised that that uh, gravy train was, you know, um, leaving the station and we weren't um, going to be part of it anymore. And we started working with businesses and early in the piece, a lot of it was the, you know, remember around the end of the start of the last decade was largely around corporate social responsibility and, you know, companies having pillars around the triple bottom line, et cetera. The big move that we've seen is people trying to integrate uh, green into their brand and subsequently green into their overall offering. So one is, you know, we recognise we have a big environmental footprint. We need to be compliant. Uh, we want to work with you around carbon credits, uh, a bit of a social licence to operate piece. But the, this circular economy, this green economy stuff is really taking off. And the conversations we're involved in, um, you know, Woodside's just one example. If I looked at the Great Barrier Reef, I could name 10 others, is increasing much more about um, you know, being part of a of a new economy. Uh, it's, first, it's, it's probably a transition at the moment because some of the market based approaches are a little bit unformed. Um, but I I think it's changing and changing a lot. Um, and I think by the end of the, the decade, I think it'll see it'll be much more integrated than um, this is the right thing to do versus this is the right thing for our business to grow approach. So definitely changing in my view. No. Uh, so, look, Anonymous asked, how have you partnered with K-12 to schools? Students I've worked with around the world feel very strongly about the environment. All the needs are opportunities, and then you can sit back and watch them be leaders. And Topo in the side panel, for instance, said, teach the, the primary school children, as Rob Masters mentioned, and the parents will follow. So, do you want to just talk a little bit about how you work with K-12 to schools? Yeah, so a, a couple of answers to that. Number one is I've got two kids of my own who regularly discipline me about my environmental footprint. <laughs> uh, and it's quite interesting when I remove, a, I live up on the Murray in Northern Victoria, and when I remove a willow, because it's an invasive weed species, um, I will get told off around, I know it's a weed species, but they'll talk about all the other ecosystem benefits that are providing. So yeah, they are, you know, the young generation is very interested. So education and community is a big part of our offering. So um, I'll give you two examples. One in Tasmania, uh, we have a, um, a program which is about biodiversity and environmental plantings, but mostly it's about climate change adaptation and providing a vehicle for, for young people to be involved. And then in Western Sydney, um, we run a cooling the schools program. So uh, schools are very much involved. Um, one of the next uh, adaptations of our strategy will probably see us parting, starting to and you may not have picked up this subtlety in my earlier comments, is uh, the reinvestment dividend, putting that back into the vision and mission. 
we will probably start picking, uh, you know, signature events, signature community, signature education programs to be the recipient of our financial dividend uh, to really uh, amplify that. It's very underfunded in this area. And, um, you know, unfortunately, um, state and federal government systems as, as uh, corporates and others are prepared to fund it, they'll back away from it. So, um, but there's not, a, there's not a sufficient volume of revenue and funding at the moment. So we'll take on that ourselves. But we think that's part of our vision. We can't distribute a dividend to a, a shareholder. So we've got no issue in putting it back into the next generation. And, you know, the next generation will be future decision makers. So that by the time we hit 2030, Greening Australia won't be finished and we won't be thinking about, um, you know, we've planted those 500 million trees, we'll sell off all the assets and retire now. We're going to, you know, we're not going to run out of work. Those kids that you're talking about, they're going to be the ones that are making decisions about us or be the CEO or the next director of Japan. Mm -hmm. That's the way we think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue has a question about uh, native logging, Sue? Yeah, basically, um doesn't matter what you tell the government and how politely you can tell them all about the economies of not having native logging, like uh, that water from our forests is a lot cheaper than from a diesel plant, that uh, tourism in our mountain ash forests would be wonderful because it's just such a fabulous place for people, uh, as in local like Melbourne or international visitors to come to. Uh, you've also got all those other economies coming from your ecosystem services, apart from the water, um, like natural cooling, like carbon sequestration, and so on and so forth. And basically, it's just a handful of jobs, really, uh, on exorbitant salaries. Um, keeping it going, I guess the real reason is it's all political. It's not based on common sense, science or economy. It is simply a political will to keep it going. Um, I suspect that the reason they said till 2030 is because that's when the, uh, basically, I can't think of the exact name of it at the moment, but effectively the wood pulp agreement with Australian paper ends but they haven't got the wood in the forest anyway to continue to 2030. And as you would know from the work that you're in, it is a lot cheaper to keep your natural environment than have to replace it. Apart from which you can't totally restore it anyway. You can't bring back those insects that were endemic to the trees and so on and so forth. So how do you get the political will because they're not interested in the science or the economy. They're just Sue, Sue, we've got business. two minutes left of Brendan's time. So that's a, great, que that's a great question that you, you put there. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll take most of it as a comment because I, I think everyone understands uh, exactly where you're coming from. So here's the first thing. Number one, I sense sometimes people feel really dejected about this. Uh, and I would say, think about how far we've become, how far we've come, where we're focusing on very isolated um, pockets now and we're going this is just not going I don't actually don't think the answer is a political one they, they play a role I think it's around consumers and companies making choices and a lot of the changes in the forestry sector most recently have come from the likes of one of our partners office works who said we're not taking that product anymore if you don't give us an alternative product we won't take it because our customers won't buy it and we won't take it to them so I think I, I reckon the greatest influence comes through uh, consumer choices uh, mm -hmm. and the choices of corporates. However, from a political will point of view, I think you are, you're, you've hit it on the head about what they're dealing with. Um, but I, I truly believe by 2030, this, this race will be run and run and won. But there'll be no wood left in the forest. Uh, I think it, there are certain areas will be, yeah, look, I don't think the whole forest is going to go. Um, there are some areas that are uh, under challenge. I, I'm actually, I'm going to switch this the other way. I'm more worried about land clearing in Queensland and New South Wales. Hmm. The scale that that is at is unbelievable. Yeah. That is, um, that is, yeah. That's so, so just we've got what, one minute left, Sue. So I think we're we're in heated yep. agreement with you. There's a yep. cheeky question here from Jeremy. I don't know if it's too hot to handle. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, do you want to ask your question about koalas? Does anyone? I haven't watched the news. Has the New South Wales government collapsed? Uh, 
Not yet, but uh, look, I think it's a political farce. Behind the cheeky question is exactly what Brendan addressed then, the land clearing and uh, the uh, political, the lack of political will to stop the land, to actually encourage the land clearing. And I was just going to ask, uh, and if you look, look, read about the Koala Wars, it's fast and it's enjoyable reading, but the serious question is land clearing. How do we stop it, Brendan? Yeah, I think it's in part, um, look at, yeah, it's, I think you're right about the koalas, by the way. <laughs> um, um, so the, uh, the land clearing piece in my mind is, um, uh, is partly what I've said throughout this last hour or so is about creating a convergence of economies, communities and environment in ways that benefit them all. Um, however, I think, you know, the, the amount, the, the, the policy instruments which allow, you know, um, farmers to go out and clear 300,000 hectares in a year you know, you know, we're talking about restoring 330,000 hectares over a decade in one state, New South Wales. You know, that's antiquated. Um, how can anybody think that is a good idea? Um, so, you know, more so than than Sue's question is, I think this um, these these blunt policy instruments that swing us right and then swing us left. You know, we're smarter than that. We're smarter than that. Middle, the middle ground is not that hard to find. Um, and farmers are up for the middle ground. Environmentalists are up for the middle ground as well. Um, th that's the thing that we've got to do is point it to a middle ground rather than it making it go hard right, hard left. Um, it's not working. No, mm -hmm. that's not an answer, by the way. I'm just saying that yep. the question is it's crazy. Yeah. Circumstances. We better let you, you go now, Julie and Brendan, but I think you can see that we're, you've left us wanting more. So I wonder in six months or so if you can come back um, and share your progress because everyone's smiling. One of the, the first habit of the optimist is to smile and everyone I can see on video is smiling. So this has been superb. I will edit um, this for the highlights um, and I hope you can put it on your channel too because it's just, uh, just so much inspiration in it. Um, Jeremy um, and I will try and emulate this in a couple of weeks to build on this on opportunity and, and innovation um, and you've just been fantastic so we're all here to help we love optimists we are <laughs> optimists and everyone um, look thanks for coming um, and I'll keep you in touch with what else we're up to and there have been a couple of questions on video links and all sorts of stuff um, that'll all be in the 24 hours after email from zoom I'll pop in all the links um, that are needed so everyone, have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you.